to the record button and we'll get going then. Okay, so good morning everyone. My name is Julie O'Brien and I am MD of a company called Runda Hospitality and Tourism Solutions. So as you know, this is the second of two sessions that aim to support you, the industry, with incorporating sustainability, a big word of the moment, into your food and drink tourism offer. So this particular session is focused on hospitality, and we have a special call out to Taste of Ulster restaurants, as we would like you to tell Food NI and Tourism NI about your sustainable dishes. So keep that in mind. In return, there is an opportunity for up to 50 restaurants to secure media promotion through Food NI and Tourism NI. So just to let you know, Michelle Sherlow will give more details on this at the end of today's session. So today we have an incredible lineup of speakers. We're going to start with Michelle Sherlow of Food NI and after that we're going to have Gary Quaid of Tourism Northern Ireland. Uh, following on from that is Connor Spacey who is Culinary Director of Food Space for, and he's going to provide uh, insights into the benefits of sustainability. Um, there, there follows then Paula McIntyre, who is well known to a lot of you, who will share the story of slow food and the causeway. And after that, we'll have Ben Quake, who is director of Big Blue Mountains, and he is going to leave us in no doubt about what a sustainable food business truly stands for. So as I said there at the beginning, at the end, we're going to allow a little time for some questions. Uh, so at that point, you'll be able to unmute yourself and dive in with a question, or please feel free to put a question into the chat box. So guys, I've been waiting here eagerly to start this morning's session. I'm for one, I'm super excited to hear what these speakers have to say today. Uh, it's been my honor to work with food, drink businesses and experiences throughout Ireland. And in fact, I'm currently working on a super exciting program in Destination Visit Morin, where there is an incredible collection of food, drink experiences that have emerged. And at the heart of those experiences, there's really a magic blend of sustainability and creativity, which we know, of course, is a hallmark throughout Northern Ireland. So really excited about today's session. Uh, for now, though, I'm going to hand over to the lady of the moment, Michelle Sherlow, uh, who's going to take us through the next couple of minutes. So over to you, Michelle. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and see. Can I share my screen? Yeah. Perfect. I'm screen sharing. So I'm going to just very quickly um, give you a little bit of background. Um, firstly, appreciate what, thank you, Julie. Um, and thanks for mentioning what we did last week as well. We had a very similar seminar, but that time for people developing experiences. And I think I'll maybe mention that again at the end. So appreciating that Northern Ireland um, has been a real food journey, um, one of great success for the last, last decade. Um, we'd had our first ever year of food and drink in 2016. Um, we had Taste the Island in 2019. And we won World's Best Food Destination, as you know, um, in 20, uh, 2018. Appreciating that everybody is coming out of lockdown and facing many challenges, but we're aware that sustainability is going to be a key issue for the future and a really key factor of choice for visitors coming to Northern Ireland. The pandemic accelerated market forces. It accelerated love, love for local. It accelerated health and a concern about health and finally the one where sustainability is really included is the focus on conscious consumerism and people being much more mindful of what they're buying um, wanting to shop more consciously and eat out more consciously. Prior to the pandemic Food NI and Taste of Ulster were working on this issue but during the pandemic um, we did actually produce the Our Food Power of Good campaign which is all about Northern Ireland's food being good for us, being good for the environment. Um, and I'm just going to show that in a little minute. We realised everybody's on a journey. Um, part of that journey is we want to work with you to promote these sustainable dishes and more of that later. But firstly, here's the Power of Good advert that's coming back onto television uh, in March.
so um, as you'll appreciate, we recorded. We had to make that during the pandemic, so we couldn't actually go out and get any fresh footage. But we are looking for footage for social media look, uh, going forward this year, and potentially for putting into the TV advert. So I'm going to, without any further ado, pass over to Gary from Tourism and I, who's been working with us on this initiative. And um, over to you, Gary. Very much, Michelle. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, Good to see so many of you joining us this morning, um, but also really nice to see some familiar faces um, on today's call. Um, and just back to Michelle's earlier point that um, last week we delivered the webinar that was focused on experiences. Today we're looking at hospitality and, and food outlets, but we'll follow up, um, Michelle, with both recordings then after today's session, just to make sure that, that, that you're getting what you need out of today's session. So um, it's really great to be able to stimulate some conversations around sustainable food and drink. Um, but also to understand how you can get involved with the activity that Food and I have got planned across the spring period. Um, and for us all, I think that we're all on a journey and hopefully for um, you all today, it's just the beginning of a really inspiring conversation. Um, so my name is Gary Quaite and I'm the Food and Drink Experience Development Officer at Tourism NI. And I'm really delighted to be here with you all for the next 90 minutes or so. Um, we've got a really great lineup and a big thanks to Ben and Connor and Paula and the, the, the team at Food and I. Um, and really our panelists here are leaning the way in their own destinations. And they're here to highlight their commitment to sustainability and the benefit that that brings to those around them. So I'm really looking forward to, to hearing their insights that they brought to share with us all this morning. But I'd also like to say that I think the team at Food and I have done a really excellent job on the Our Food, The Power of Good campaign. I think it's a really lovely piece that we can all be proud of, one that we can all get behind but it really demonstrates the journey that we've all been on collectively to improve not only the quality of our food and drink, but also that perception piece, the perception of what we have to offer and how we can portray that to our consumers and our visitors. And I think that as a destination, we've got much more confidence in what we do and how we do it. And today's session is really about taking that conversation a bit further as we explore opportunities around sustainability and regenerative tourism and food and drink experiences. So from my perspective, why are we focusing on food and drink? Why is that such an important strand that we're focusing on today? Well, from a tourism angle, not everyone that comes to Northern Ireland does so to play golf or to go to an attraction or an event, but everyone eats. And every person that visits here is engaging in food tourism at some point, whether they know it or not. But linking back to Michelle's and um, piece, today's visitors are much more cultured, they're better informed, they're well-traveled, and they're in search of new experiences that they can't get anywhere else. So they will seek out and pay for experiences that show concern for the environment, but also the local communities. Today's visitor wants to experience food and drink from a completely different perspective. So what's in people's minds now when they think of food and drink? Um, and I think we'll all agree that the idea of food tourism has evolved massively, even in the last 10 years. It's become less passive and more participatory, but it seems that COVID has shifted those formulas again and while the need to consider how we portray Northern Ireland as a sustainable food drink destination has always been there, it's almost come down on top of us as a result of the pandemic. pandemic. Our travellers are more conscious about the impact that their choices and behaviours have on the planet. Regenerative tourism is the future. Um, and also is the support that businesses provide to their local communities and to their employees. And that is all going to experiences. But if we are to do it, it has to be authentic and it has to be transparent. So Food and I and Tourism and I are here this morning to help businesses on that journey. Food and I are working on the delivery of a toolkit, which will be distributed to um, all of our industry participants. It really has a focus on sustainability. And Michelle and her team will also give an update on how you can get involved to amplify the great work that you're all doing within your own businesses um, with a, a specific uh, food and drink campaign. So we're inviting you all to be a part of that program. We hope today hope, um, will help you get some ideas, will provide inspiration, and we hope that you will share those ideas and experiences with us. So please um, get involved this morning, ask questions, use the chat function, unmute yourselves, um, and there will be time at the end of the session for questions and answers, and um, we look forward to hearing from you. So I'm going to pass over to Julie, and we'll get into this morning's session, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. 
Well, thank you so much, Gary and Michelle. I've actually written a couple of notes based on some of the key words you said there. We might come to those at the end. Some very interesting stuff there. Um, right now, though, Connor Spacey, I believe we're up for a duet, are we? Yeah, I think we are. Yes. Lovely, <laughs> lovely to have you, Connor. So how thank about you. we kick off? You let people know who you are and, you know, what the food space is all about. Yeah, um, thanks, Guy. I, I'm delighted to be part of, of this today. So I kind of have two hats. So food space is our is our uh, business here in, in Ireland and also in the UK. Um, we're a contract or management catering company. So we would work with big clients, different types of clients throughout, as I said, Ireland and the UK on their uh, food systems and food programs within the workplace. So I, I hate to refer to the word of canteens or anything. It's far removed from what we might have experienced um, previously. But the idea is um, food space itself is seven years old. We currently run 25 cafes and it's all based um, on a fully sustainable uh, ethos right from start to finish. So from where our food comes from, how it travels, how it gets to us, what we do with it um, and how we, 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 we work with waste and what we work with our packaging and everything that food touches which is huge, obviously, the, the entire food system. Um, and I also work with the, a, a nonprofit organization that we founded six years ago called the Chef's Manifesto, which is a United Nations and World Food Program backed uh, initiative. We launched that four years ago, just going on four years ago. Um, and it's now in over 100 countries. The manifesto itself is in um, English, French, German, Spanish, um, Chinese, Japanese, and we just released it in Dubai in Arabic as well. So the idea there is to work on a global food system um, and giving chefs the tools to, to make their kitchens more sustainable um, and looking at food globally, because while it's so important to look at our food local, food is global and food will always be global. Food will always have to travel um, and we have to bear that in mind as well. So that's my two hats. That's kind of where I, I, I sit at the moment. Um, Jeepers, Connor, that, that, that's super impressive. And you said that the, the business, the food space has been in operation for the seven last seven years. So sustainability has always been a cornerstone of what you do. Is that right? Always. Yeah. From, from day one, when we set up food space, the idea was we looked um, like sustainability was something for me. I've been studying for over 20 years. So I'm not sure whether that's a good or a bad thing because while I'm studying it for 20 years and the food system is progressively got worse, but there's reasons behind that as well. Um, so food space was the idea behind it was to, to <clears throat> run a food system, run a company that is solely based on a sustainable ethos. You know what I mean? So it was kind of like throwing out every rule book that we know um, and starting again on, on how, how to showcase what a sustainable food system looks like. So to, to give you a little idea, we would feed before COVID and we're getting back there now, we would produce about 2.5 million meals a year just in Ireland. So it's, it's on a large scale, a large to us, um, but on a sustainable footprint. Wow. And, and can I just ask, so why sustainability? Like why has that become a cornerstone of, of what you do? It's a good question. And, and sustainability is something that, you know, we, we have to address it. So our food system globally and on the island of Ireland is broken. Um, and what does that mean? It means that as, as we move on, if we don't do anything about it, it's going to get progressively worse, not for our businesses, for our, our uh, population, for our visitors. Um, and in the hospitality industry, we have a huge responsibility to be able to fix it. And what I mean by that, if you think that we're, we're, the, we're the middle people, so we, we um, whatever our background is at a hotel, cafes, restaurants, um, we have a purse of money where we procure ingredients every single day of the week. And with that, obviously, we make um, lovely, we create lovely dishes and lovely food experiences that we sell to our, to our customers. So as the in-between people, we have a huge decision on how we spend our money and and where we spend it. And we also have a, a huge responsibility on how we can educate our customers as to what a sustainable food system looks like. And in some ways, you, you, it, it can be going against trends as such um, and, and, and really highlighting, you know, 
what ingredients should be on a plate. Like, what does a sustainable plate of food look like? Uh, to give an example, um, one that always kind of gets me going, like, if, if we think of an avocado, okay? So an avocado is this cool, trendy food for the last 10 years where, <laughs> you know, it, it's just become a, a massive um, growth for, for that industry. But here in Ireland, um, up to 90% of our avocados actually come from South America and Mexico areas. And they are one of the most unsustainable crops grown on this planet today. And that's due to deforestation, due to uses of energy and water, but also there's a human trafficking element of it. There's a whole um, issues around that. So we've never had them. We've, from our, in our seven years, we've never had an avocado. Uh, but we explain to our customers why. It's not about going... You know, we don't we don't use a certain ingredient. It's about explaining why we don't use a certain ingredient, and it's about explaining what a better and more sustainable alternative is. So there's a bit of a mix of when you're eating with us, you're not just eating great food, you're also getting an experience around sustainability and hopefully taking something away from the table where you can go home and really reflect on what changes can be made as individuals. Okay, Connor. so some of the stuff you said there, and thank you so much for explaining it so succinctly and clearly, because, you know, you're really putting it into language and the example of the avocado that we can wrap our heads around. And I suppose avocado very much known as a superfood, you know, lots of us mm -hmm. purchasing them from the supermarkets and other places. But hearing in its context, you know, while we might know its health benefits, it's not actually a sustainable ingredient. So you're making us think we in hospitality, uh, you know, people like you, people, you know, people who are joining us here this morning, the participants, we are the spenders, we are the choosers, and we need to make wise decisions in that regard. But what I also like is, I suppose you use the word education, we're educating the customer while also making sure they have a lovely memory, a lovely experience. That, that's basically what you're saying, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and, yeah. and I, I suppose a lesson learned from, we do a lot of marketing around obviously what we do, so our, our, our customers can take, take these issues away with them to, to think about as well and changes they can do. But it's not about um, beating a drum and going, you must do this and you must not do that. Yeah. It's, about, it's about giving people the actual information that's real and letting them decide. You can't force people uh, um, as in individuals, as in consumers, um, you can't force them down the path, but you can educate them and let them give them the correct information where they can then make the decisions. Yeah. So the whole idea around the food is it's a journey on education as well as, as, as eating well. So I really like how you're connecting with us as the hospitality providers, making decisions along with, you know, informed decisions and then supporting our customers also, in fact, through what we provide with informed decisions too. That's really, really insightful. Can I just ask you something else? The consumer, the benefit from the consumer's perspective, would you say that's education or are there other benefits too? Edu education is the biggest benefit. I suppose the biggest feedback we get from all, all our, our customers is when, when we, we, we pick an issue. So each month we actually market a different issue around food, uh, globally and, and, and locally. Um, and a lot of it is they never knew. You know, so to me, the, the biggest feedback I get is I didn't know that. I didn't know that, you know, farm fish has such a big implication and avocado, um, fruits, um, you know, palm oils, there's all these different situations. And each month, as I said, we highlight one and we show the difference on our menus. And people, people are hungry to know the information because yeah. a, lot of, a lot of consumers say to me is that they want to make change on how they eat out, what they eat, and also in their homes, but they don't know where to start. It can, very, it can seem very overwhelming. If you're yeah. at home, to, wh where do you make a choice you know, to be more sustainable. And then when you go out, how to eat more sustainably in a cafe or restaurant, hotel, you know, people are more conscious now than ever before, but they don't have the information to give to them the power of decisions. Yeah. Um, so education is definitely the biggest driver um, and allowing people to make their own. You can't force it. OK, I'm aware I'm with you now just for the next uh, little more than 15 minutes or so. And I've literally written down a ton of questions for you here, Connor, because some of the stuff you're saying is so interesting. Um, I just see a question coming in on the chat there. So the avocado, uh, you know, not sustainable. What, what's the sustainable equivalent? Like, what would you be recommending on the menu? 
Well, in, ter in terms of nutrients and, and the actual healthy side of an avocado, which it does contain, and again, this is not a knock on avocados. Avocados that are grown within Europe and all are very sustainable There's in France and Spain and also further afield in African countries and so on. But we don't have access to them here in Ireland. So in Ireland, um, we, we substitute it with um, spinaches and kales throughout the year, which contain a higher nutrient level, are actually better for you and are local to us on the island of Ireland. And are local to us, very good. Okay, all right. I'm going to keep the questions come hard and fast, Connor, because I want to good. make sure that we okay. get as much information out of your head as possible. Okay, we've seen the benefits from the customer's perspective. Come on, tell us, what's the benefit from the business perspective? Like, is it profitable for kitchens to be sustainable? Absolutely, and, and the key point is, if you're not financially sustainable, well, then you're not in business. So sustainability does does begin with your with your with your with your money, with your profit and loss, and and a business model. And to simplify it, I suppose what we do, we all we all um, know that every month or every week we get a PL, a profit and loss sheet. We have you know our income, our cost of cost of food, and then our overheads. On every single sheet in hospitality, there's a wastage element. If you're not putting it in, your accountant is putting it in. So dependent on the volume of food, whether you're a hotel, that can be up to 10%. You know, when you're doing large functions and so on, restaurants, cafes can fall in around 8 9%, some 5%. So if you take an average of 8 or 9% of, of, of food waste, and then you put that back, in, say in layman terms, you spend £100,000 um, a year on ingredients, and you have 10% wastage. You're basically saying it's okay for me to throw ten thousand pounds in the bin. If you yeah. think about that, like that is just crazy in yeah. any kind of business model. So for us to run zero waste kitchens, we take that margin and we put it back up to the top level, which gives us more money for further investment and the, and to buy better and to buy you know better food and so on because we're not wasting it. So it, it, it's a rethink of a broken model. You know what I mean? In in simple terms. So Connor, can I just ask there, are you saying, because you did say that I think you provide two and a half million meals a year just in one mm -hmm. fast of your business, which is enormous. Are you saying there is no food waste or there is food waste and you're doing something different with that? Exactly. It's how to determine there's two types of food waste. There's food waste, which comes in your back door in terms of packaging and so on, how your food gets to you. Okay. There's food waste in what I call production waste. So that's us as chefs, how we um, prepare our food. So when preparing food, we throw away our skins, our fruit peels. You know, um, we want a, a piece of meat or a piece of fish to look a certain way and present a certain way. So we have all this production waste. And then we have our plate waste, which is our <clears throat> portion size, which is not what's not eaten on the plate that comes back to the, um, into the kitchen. It's identifying all these different facets of food waste and really concentrating on what can be done. The plate waste is the more difficult one because once waste comes back in on the plate, you can't do anything with that. So that, that's going to compost, but you can manage it. You can manage the quantity of what it is. Um, and that's a simple term for us where we weigh our plate waste and we work out what a percentage that is of the food that we produce. And that can lead to very simple steps like are our portions too big? Is there an element on a dish that keeps coming back that no one wants. If it's a slice of tomato, but then remove the tomato. It's about yeah. really understanding every single dish you produce and what the customers are telling you by what they're eating or not eating on it. Um, and managing that cost is, is a huge one, um, but an easy win. You know what I mean? It's understanding what's behind it. Yeah. Um, and, and production waste, again, makes up the biggest percentage. And I always use the example of a cauliflower. I'll be very quick on this. You buy in a head of cauliflower. For average, say it's costing you two pounds. The head of cauliflower comes, it's got the white in the middle, it's got all the green leaves, it's got the stem, the stalk and everything on it. As chefs, we're programmed or taught to get the best of the cauliflower, which is the white part. So we trim off the leaves, the stalk, um, the stems, the whole lot. We throw that out at best, it goes to compost. And we have our white cauliflower, and we create whatever dish. So we've thrown out almost 50% of the cauliflower. So now the cauliflower is costing us three pounds. We bought it for two, we threw away 50%, it's costing us three. Then we paid someone to come and collect the waste that we threw out into the bin, which you can add on another. So now we've paid double for our cauliflower just to create a dish using the white part of it. 
And um, so financially, it's cost us <clears throat> double before we even created a dish. Okay. By using all of it, you have made more money by utilizing every single piece of the ingredient. And that's where we, we run fermentation programs and dehydration and pickling and all these different um, ways of preserving food and ensuring that we use absolutely everything, which in turn means we have to mature less because we have more ingredients to create more dishes, which are more profitable. That's super. That's really fascinating. Connor. You're actually even making me think about my own home kitchen here and improvements I can make beyond. So talk about educating uh, the consumer there. Can I just ask you, you said of 100% of investment, say, in food, that often in businesses, it can be 10%, maybe more that's lost on food waste. So yeah. in your world, what's the percentage? What have you gotten that down to? We're down to 2% and that's plate waste. Plate waste. And that's okay. plate waste. So that, and that's, that's the waste that um, when we get down to 2%, you're, we're kind of at the situation where do we just make portions smaller to eradicate that? But then you're also alienating people that might think it's less value for money. <clears throat> so what we try to do is we're at the 2%. It's, it's, it's where that goes. So we ensure that we close a loop system. So our kitchens, some of our kitchens, we can compost on site. Some kitchens, it's taken away and composted, but it's given back in the community that grow more food to bring back to us. Okay. So it's, it's closing a loop on, on a smaller waste that we have and ensuring that that's used to grow more food for us to procure and bring back into our kitchens. Yeah, uh, Connor, and I really like that you are watching what's coming in and the food plate and maybe even, you know, uh, even, so I suppose it's a very solution-driven model, isn't it? You're looking Absolutely. at maybe where every business looking at maybe flaws that can be corrected so that you become more efficient. So super, super interesting. Okay, can I ask you something else? Um, I'm very interested in what you said about the avocado versus the spinach and kale. And I worked a lot in the international market. So this is something I'm very passionate about. Often the international person comes into Ireland and we present something foreign on the plate. We, we may offer them something, I don't know, even things like wine or a quiche or that kind of thing, when actually they repeatedly ask for what is, uh, for what is local. So can I just ask you, how important is it the utilization of local suppliers and local produce? It's absolutely huge. And you know what? It's probably one of the biggest solutions to fixing our food system here in Ireland. Um, and I mean, we only have to see the news to know that, to give you figures, actually, on the island of Ireland, um, 20 years ago, there was over 600 horticulture vegetable growers. That's now less than 100. So that's how quickly people are moving away from farming in Ireland um, because there's lack of support. There's a bigger issue there where we talk about lack of support within, within governments um, and legislation, but there's also us as, as consumers and as buyers for our businesses can really approach that in a better way. And for me, when we plan our menus, as a chef, we, we, you know, chefs in their nature can be very creative and they want to create food that tastes great and looks well on the plate. And in a lot of cases, they're not necessarily thinking about the carbon footprint or the, the outcome of producing this food. Um, we work in a different way. So each week, all our head chefs get a list of everything on the island of Ireland that is in season right now. And with that list, that's all they can procure for their fresh food. So yes, we import exotic, you know, uh, fruit, tea, coffee, chocolate, spices. But when it comes to our fresh food, we're able to keep that on the island of Ireland and work within the seasons. But it's not what a chef might want to do. We, our farmers tell us, this is what's coming up. This is what's ready next week. This is what I'm harvesting in two weeks or whatever that might be. Or we also, um, when they occur problems around, you know, the, the, it's too wet or it's too dry and a different harvest, we work with them on that. To me, the farmers are the heroes of the entire food system. So it's not about talking to, at them. It's about listening to them. They know the land more than any of us ever will as chefs. And we need, we need to educate ourselves on what they can do and work with them as opposed to creating food because it looks great and it tastes great. But you know what? You know, 60, 70% of it could have been imported. You know, it's probably the worst, most highest carbon footprint um, and emission than any other food. So to me, it's key. And it's also key for the economy and basing it back into your locality. 
Yeah, so what I really love there, so there's a lovely narrative coming out of what you're saying, Connor, because, you know, you're one voice doing a thing in your own business. And then how, and we've got lots of participants here this morning, we could make this a collective, and I'm sure there are other people who've joined the same, who've begun the journey or are midway or advanced in the journey like yourself, um, how a collective of voices could really affect change uh, from the perspective of hospitality. And what I really love in what you're saying is you're bringing, you know, it's not chefs in isolation, but like the farming story coming together with the chef and actually putting that narrative on the plate. And now I'm going to ask you something back because, you know, in Ireland, we can make the mistake of complaining about our seasons. So, you know, we can be joyful about the bounty of spring, autumn and summer. So what happens when we come to seasons like winter? There are, so, okay, you, you have the, 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 what we call the dry spell in harvest, which is mo mainly later, it's mainly around February, March, which we're coming into now, where we're in between, you know, we're starting to plant, not much as harvest is ready, but there's a lot of stock, there's a lot of stock elements. So a lot of farmers will have stockpiled from the last harvest, especially around root vegetables, and um, potatoes, carrots, parsnips, turnips, celeriacs, all these lovely vegetables that are not coming out of the ground right now, but they would have a three weeks or a month ago and are ready um, for sale. We also, because of our fermentation programs, we prepare last harvest and we pick and ferment certain foods to be ready for now. So when we come to what we call the dry spell with it, within harvesting, our menu switches more to ferment and pickle foods. Yes, we have fresh items as well, but we're, we're adding elements onto our plate because we have less food available. And that's about working with the seasons. Once you know what's coming up and farmers will educate us on that, we can plan in advance as to what our food is going to look like. OK, and also we're not just emphasizing then, you know, the, the quality of local food projects, but also seasonality. The fact that, you know, 100%. This fresh, which is really interesting. I'm just going to call out one thing that really has stuck out in my mind from something you said. I wrote it down here that using local suppliers is key to us resolving our food problem. I think that needs to be put out in capital letters for everyone here this morning. Um, really interesting. So, Connor, can I just ask there? Um, so we, we have people who've joined us this morning, you know, some who have very you know, I'm sure, like myself, varying uh, levels of understanding around food waste and sustainability. Um, what, you know, just think about someone who's not begun this journey at all. What are your top tips based on all the experience that you've gained over these last number of years? I, th I think the biggest thing is to start in small steps. If you want, if you come up with an idea that you want your restaurant, hotel or whatever it might be, kitchen to be sustainable and you go in gun ho you're going, you're going to trip up. You, you need to, 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 to map out a course of where you're going to begin and where you're going to end and, and, and do it in baby steps that you're not overwhelmed because it, it's an overwhelming broken system. If you look at the entire food system, you will be overwhelmed. You'll, 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 it'll be very hard to understand where to begin and what to do. The first thing we always do with our new kitchens and new chefs joining us is we, we start off at one day. We take a day where we remove all the bins from our kitchens. There's no bins in the kitchens. And we say everything you would have put in a bin, you now must put into containers. You know, so we've got fruit here, veg peels here, whatever, the, tr meat trimming, fish, whatever it is. And they're all put into different containers. And at the end of the shift, we identify every single one of what would have went into a bin from production waste. And then we identify ways of how we can put that into our menu and we use that in dishes. And there's different ways, as I said, fermentation, picking, dehydrating. Some of it is making stocks yeah. and soups because it's about, if you don't look at the food, that's got, once the food has gone into bin, it's out of sight, out of mind. And that's difficult then to, to visualize it. We literally pour it out onto the tables in our kitchens and go, right, here's today's production waste that was going to the bin. This is all edible. This is all food. What are we going to do with it? And then we start our training process from there um, and our chefs get on board. Like we're, we're constantly training, you know, um, it's, it's not a, we've done that, let's move on. It's a constant, as the seasons change, our menus change, there's, there's, new, there's new waste to identify. Um, and a lot of the answers are in the past, really, to be honest with you, in terms of how to preserve food and use everything from it. <clears throat> there so your first piece is take bins away and make um, and it's waste 
you've broken up there. I don't know, is it me or? It's visible, so that we have to do something. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry. Oh. Hey, Bear? I can So just that our food is visible, isn't that correct? Can you hear yes. me now, Connor? Yes. Yeah, I can, yeah, you're coming in out there. No, you're 100%. The big thing is not to hide your food waste and put it in the bin. It's to actually visualize. I might your, have, yeah. Can you hear me now? It's to, it's to visualize your food waste and identify what it is and what you can do with it. Someone's gone. And then... Julie, um, Connor, I'm sure she can back to us in, 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 in a minute or two. Um, no problem. And, and while she does that, Connor, I mean, I found a lot of the a lot of a lot of the the comments and the real practical tips that businesses actually can take away after today's call in terms of using seasonality not only to look at your local producers but also look at the changes that that's having in the in the kitchen in terms of food waste. What can we do with this? Um, some of the feedback, Connor, from our own businesses has been looking at that um, corporate social responsibility space in terms of, you know, how can we support the local community? How can we support other local businesses potentially through food waste? And um, it would be really interesting to hear um, from you, Connor, in terms of others that, that, that you're supporting through kitchen outfits. Yeah, I suppose depending on our locations, because geographically we're quite spread out, we're very much getting involved with our communities at every level that we can. Um, some, some, of our, some of us is around education, which I mentioned earlier is so important, where we um, plant seeds and we grow vegetables in primary schools. Um, and then we work with the, with the children up to harvest, where they harvest that. And then we teach them how to cook the different food and, and what they can do and how to use all of it. So what we're trying to do there is connect the next generation to the true value of food. Um, our food, we, we, we also team up with some charities in terms of food deliveries where we actually donate food back into our communities um, for, for those that don't have access to food, which unfortunately is, is a huge problem in Ireland. Not just, it's not just a, you know, in, in underdeveloped countries, it's right here on a doorstep. Um, it's, it's literally about coming up with different ideas. But the biggest one, the biggest feedback I suppose we've got is by, by buying local within our communities, our communities have grown. Um, and I've seen like our butchers, our fishmongers, our vegetable um, producers, because we're, okay, we buy quite a lot of food to produce the amount of meals we do. But by, by keeping that within each community, their businesses have grown and they have created more employment and they have you know, been able to reinvest into their community. And it's a whole closed loop system. Like feeding, ha having a restaurant or hotel in a certain town and feeding customers is one thing, but being inclusive and working with your community and your food that's there is the future. And that's how we can all grow together, yes. you know, um, and, 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 and be better for all and educate each other along the way. That's the biggest, biggest thing. I mean, in this industry, we learn every single day. I'm over 30 years in this industry and I still learn something new every day because we're having these conversations. And that to me is the most important part about moving to a more sustainable future. Okay. Have Julie back, I'm not sure. No. No, we'll give, we'll give Julie another moment. Um, no. Connor, um, look, thanks very much. We'll wait to, for, for Julie to, to, to maybe look back around and you, you're going to be on the call with us anyway until we finish yeah. in terms of picking up some questions. And I know that there'll be some pointers there that you raised that, that others will want to come back to. Um, no problem. We're delighted now. We'll probably hand over then to, to, to Orla just to load um, Paula's slides. Mm -hmm. um, Paula McIntyre, um, Director of Slow Food UK, is going to talk to us about her um, passion and love for the slow food movement um, within Northern Ireland and paying particular focus to the work that she's doing um, within the destination, but also through, uh, through Chase Causeway. So over to mm -hmm. you, Paula. Thanks, Gary. Uh, thanks for the thanks for the upgrade there. Just director of Northern Ireland, so not UK, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, no, uh, so so slow food. Um, uh, first of all, slow food is not about cooking slowly, so it's not a it's not a stew movement. Uh, to it is I think it's it's sustainable. Um, 
to me, to put it in a nutshell, it's really the way our grandparents produce food. So you were using everything from any meat that we produce. So nose to tail uh, with vegetables, root to shoot, naturally organic, and then um, eating seasonally. So all of that there. So uh, can I have the next wee slide there, please, Orla? Um, Lovely. So, um, so it's a global movement, uh, 165 countries, we've got loads of supporters. Um, it is a charity and, uh, and in that way, you know, the, it is a charity, but also it's, a, it's for me, um, Slow Food articulated really the way that I cook. So, it's a, you know, probably a wee bit old fashioned, you know, not being aware of waste, um, celebrating what we have around us um, and, uh, and also cooking sustainably and sourcing sustainably. Uh, now, we started up a slow food um, taste, a slow food causeway last year. Uh, some, for, uh, some of the taste causeway members are already supporters. So we've got um, supporters of slow food like Brock Gammon Farm, uh, Broiter Gold and Corndale Farm as well. Uh, could I get the next one, please, there? Um, that's it. So um, it's, there we are, it's partnered. Um, that, that um, at the bottom there, good, clean and fair. So that's our that's our motto and that's what we live by. That's what I try to live by. And in every what in sourcing food, um, in um, in the way I cook, and um, also in the way I treat my people, anybody that comes along and works for me, all has to be good, clean and fair. So um in Italy, the slow food, um, you have the slow food uh, logo, the snail. Um, you would see that in a lot of restaurants um, outside on the, on the window of, of restaurants or inside. And that would really, and it has the same, it's on a par with the Michelin logo. You know, so it's like, um, and, and again, Michelin are, are stepping up to the, the plate with sustainability. They have a green star now system. So um, this is, sorry, that's great, Orla, go for it there. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. So this is a, this is a fan, the Cole family up, up outside Ballycastle. It's a small working farm, so it's it's only 40 acres. And again, to get back to our grandparents, you know, it wasn't about big farms. It was about um, small farms around that size that sustained, sustained, uh, we, we sustained ourselves and then sold a bit to as well. So um, with the, with the uh, Brock Gammon, so billy goats and male calves are a waste product from the dairy industry or normally end up being destroyed. So what they've done They've produced meat. Um, they have a they, you can have a farm tour of what they're doing there. They have a farm shop. They have a cafe. They have foraging tours. They they grow seasonal vegetables now, and they sell their meat. So, and in twenty seventeen, uh, they won the best uh, for um, the Street Food Awards, the British Street Food Awards. They won the best snack for their goat awful taco. So a waste product from a waste product. So that's uh, that was good. Um, can we go on to the next uh, slide there? And this is um, Islander Kelp. So this is uh, Kate Burns from Islander Kelp. And um, Kate, uh, the, the Islander Kelp was um, a, a, a one of the finalists in the, the Radio 4 Food Programs Food and Farming Awards a few years ago. And the judge, John Vincent, um, described this business as organic, progressive and retrograde all at one in a symbiotic nature with the seas around them. And I think that for... To be a sustainable business, you need to be progressive and retrograde. And um, you also need to be in symbiotic nature with everything around you. So that includes the, your local um, eating seasonally. Um, and, uh, and I think that, I mean, it is, I mean, from my point of view, it's easier, it's easy to me for, to, to plan a menu around what's available. And, and then Another important thing for me is, is to tell a story when I'm making up a menu. And I think that's something that we really need to get back to and celebrate. Um, and if we go on to the next one, uh, please, Orla. So this is uh, Ursha Minor. So again, Ursha Minor, uh, a sardo, a bakery. Um, they do coastal foraging tours with Claire McQuillan from Feasting of Wheat on Weeds. And these are, this is something that, re that people are really embracing at the moment. So it's the, they're a vegetarian cafe. Um, which uh, I didn't really notice until I was writing a Taste Causeway book. And I said, you know, I was having, um, interviewing them and thinking, oh, wait a minute, this is, this is vegetarian, which is the way it should be. You know, food should be very attractive without having to, you know, you know without having, having to have a lot of meat. So, um, and if we go on to the next one, please. Uh, 
So Source Grow is something that I got involved with last year. So it's uh, started with Helen Keys, and if we go on to the next wee one there, um, and we had a launch uh, that Michelle there and and Helen and then um, I think Adam I think it was called Adam's actually a, a Ryanair pilot who grows vegetables so as well so uh, the thing about it is with with Source Grow a lot of a lot of chefs want to use um, want to use local seasonal but uh, it's a, it's difficult to source so this Source Grow brings everything together so you can you can get your vegetables. And that will be so it's still in a sort of in progress but hopefully that will bring everything because that was one of the things that we when we were working with chefs they said that, that they can't afford, can't afford the time or to go and to drive to a farm to pick up you know so while it's a beautiful idea it's not practical and i mean last week i was I was doing a thing with invest in a webinar and simon dugan from yellow door we were talking about sustainability again and as simon put it it's not just about being fluffy and lovely and, and having sustainability. Now, when they tender for something, it's it's 50% of the tender is showing sustainability. So this is something that will, that affects all our businesses. So it's not it's not a nice thing to do. It's not like being in, involved with a lovely movement like Slow Food. It's about our profits and it's about getting business. Uh, so we have next slide then, sorry, please. Uh, yeah, there's Danny Miller. So he's a, a big supporter of, uh, slow, of uh, the Source Grow and Slow Food actually. But one of the things that I think, you know, when we think of North, we think of France, we think of it as very regional, same with Italy. We don't really think of Northern Ireland as a, as regional, but it really is. You know, there are breads in Northern Ireland that are particular to certain parts, like Roussel from, you would get Roussel bread in East Antrim, which is a kind of potato bread. Indian sodas, which you get around the glens. Box day that you get in the Northwest and also in Fermanagh. You know, with vegetables like Leona's in the call there, her carrots that are grown in sandy soil, best carrots in the world. Our potatoes are all of a place. And other things, you know, like we we have a a, a, a say a, we have water in the Malochne and you have pollen, trout, eel, dolichin coming out of that, and you never see it in the menu. Um, well, what we'll see is sea bass and you'll see sea bass and they'll put local sea bass doesn't that's an oxymoron it doesn't exist we can't it's not legal to to commercially fish sea bass in this in, in our waters so what you're ending up with you're putting this thing local on a menu it doesn't mean anything and, and you know in some ways sustainable is, is in danger of becoming that you know local where it doesn't mean anything that you know it's a marketing ploy so you know as connor was saying earlier you know about the avocado i mean we don't need to we don't need to it's the same with even with lemons you know i pickle a lot of things pick up white currants in this in the summer and use them for if you need astringency in your menu we another bugbear with me is um asparagus you know asparagus is on menus now it's the, it, it's coming from peru it, ta it doesn't taste of anything you know i think we need to get back to waiting for when things are available and, and celebrating as as they're available instead of having to have asparagus on, in, a, on a menu in February, strawberries in your Christmas menu, and then you've got parsnips. I've got parsnips in July that have actually come from Australia. I mean, that's you know, the other thing about menus. You know, you go into a restaurant and you get this big laminated tome. It's like a book, you know, and it's lam. I think if you have a laminated menu, I'm not going to visit you. Because the, just it just shows there's there's nothing everything is is there it's uh you know you've got these lo lots and lots of stock it's not going to be fresh it's not going to be there's you know it's it's not uh, it's not what I want to eat so you see that uh, one of the best um, examples would be New Forge House in Macarlin and I was there a couple of a couple of summers ago you get a menu it's on a page it's uh, it's what's available. Uh, you get two choices and and it's difficult that choice is difficult you know to make whereas you go to these big big menus and think and there's nothing appealing on it you know so when you have a when you cut down on your when you cut down on your choice you're cutting down on your waste another thing that um, i think we need to get back to is thinking about our menus so if you're going to make pasta you're going to use egg yolks but where are the whites going Another thing is, uh, as as Connor said there earlier about the about the the um, cauliflower. I mean, that's a new thing, that cutting this cauliflower all back and losing all that. The leaves are great. Um, I use carrot tops. I use beetroot tops. Use um, 
you know, anything like that, they're, they're another vegetable and we're, and we're ignoring them, you know, and you get, you know, parsley roots, things like that. Um, another thing, I think we're over peeling things. They're in not in the compost. Get a good, get, scrub them as well. And Helen on the right there actually is, uh, is growing rice in uh, Ballanderry outside Cookstown. So we, you know, we can grow everything in this country. I worked in um, the Ramore restaurant in the 80s um, and when they, when they had a Michelin rating. And I remember a big, a big polystyrene box coming in uh, with stuff from Paris. And then in that box, there would have been things like veal, uh, herbs, fresh herbs, lettuce. And we realise now we can grow all of that. And I, and I was really um, quite shocked to see that we've gone from 600 farms to 100. And yeah. I think, you know, that's something that we you know, really need to look at. If I could go on to the other uh, other slide, just a few things here. So beetroot again. So this is a Babushka uh, cafe up in uh, Port Rush. So this is a, a his uh, porch. So Babushka, there is a Russian uh, element to, to their, to George Nelson's story that if you want to find out, there's a book coming out, a Taste Causeway book next month that you can hear the whole story about. Uh, if we move on to the next one, there's a farm outside Port Rush, and they do um, uh, they do the, they have a, a vending machine uh, for milk, and they also do so it's the milk coming from the farm. So this is nudie, made with ricotta from the milk, and then the, the pork they have rare breed pork, so it's a ragu with the pork, and uh, and then if you move uh, if you move on again, so when you make ricotta, you end up with whey. So this is a, a is lamb belly uh, from Glen Spark Glen uh, Red Spark Farm in the Glens. So I've cooked the lamb in the in the whey, and then pressed it and panned it. The vegetable are is another waste thing at the top of Brussels sprouts that we just throw out. Be absolutely beautiful, my one of my I hate Brussels sprouts, and I have to say, but the tops are fantastic. And then the sauce is made with the whey, and we've got a bit of lovage in that. So if we could move on to the next one, um, so Ling, so I, Ling is an, uh, this is a, a brand out of Ling. So Ling is a sustainable fish that we catch off the north coast. I've made that into a brand ad, um, and then some, some spuds. I think those spuds are from uh, Br um, Brighter Gold, um, Richard Kane's spuds. So everything there, the, the fennel tops from my garden, and so so is a radish. So everything from here, and we need to get back to celebrating. You know the fish that we have here we don't need to be eating local farmed <laughs> sea bass from turkey um you know and another thing is you have a situation now with the weather in this country if you if the boats don't go out then don't have fish in the menu don't resort to farmed or frozen just forget about it this is a good thing about changing your menu. and if we can move on i'm gonna um finish now sorry <laughs> if we move okay. on this is great, Paula. Yeah. So the last one here, this is again a uh, broider gold carrots. So they grow, they have rapeseed oil, they have carrots. So the carrots are cooked in the oil like a coffee. But a lot of the times, if, you know, a lot of chefs will, you, uh, will throw that oil out. So I made a, a made a, a um, an aioli with the oil, and and then the there's some sess there's a furikake there made with uh, the peelings, scrub the peelings, dehydrated them, ground them up with uh, some sesame seeds there and a wee bit of black onion seeds. So you're using every part of the carrot and there's a wee few leaves there of the carrot. So I think just to sum up, I think, you know, the other thing that we, we're in Slow Food that we work very closely with the Rare Breed Survival Trust. And I think on a menu now, we need to get back to, you know, the, in, in Ireland, we have this model where you have the, you have the three quarters of the plate as meat. And it doesn't matter where that meat comes from. And then there's a token vet gesture of vegetables and then probably spuds. We need to turn that on its head and we need to start sourcing good meat from this country and supporting our farmers here. And, you know, and then having a small amount of meat, because if you've really good quality, small amount of meat, even from a cheaper cut, it's going to have a massive amount more flavour than something that has been, you know, forced and it's, it doesn't taste of anything. So, and I think we really need, with COVID, I think people know the value now. They're cooking at home. They know the value of food. It's not enough now to go out and eat chicken goujons that have come from a you know, frozen food company. And they want to see food. They want the story. They want the heritage. They want more to, to know about where their food has come from. And, and as part of Slow Food, we're, we're educating everybody now. It's not just kids. It's about everybody where their food is. 
and demanding more. I mean, we have a situation in Ukraine now that's going to have a knock on effect. So we have to get back and supporting our local farmers, not, not importing. We don't need to eat asparagus. Eat asparagus when it's available in May, when it's delicious. And forget yeah. about having that, that dung that they serve in the supermarkets now. Just forget about it, okay? Okay, Paula, okay. super, okay. super stuff there. And actually my mouth is watering from the dishes. Apologies <laughs> for the issue, Connor. I was getting so excited about the cauliflower there. I think myself and my internet were getting uh, overexcited <laughs> about that. So sorry, I left you there for a moment, but I actually didn't miss much. Uh, I was here in the background. I could visualize all of you. So delighted to be back in again. Um, just picking up on a couple of things that you said there as Ben gets ready to uh, share his slides there. I love Paula that you said good, clean and fair. Um, I always think in, in tourism and hospitality businesses, we need to have absolute integrity. So I'm going to borrow those words. Actually, I think they're very strong and defines all of that. Um, and both both you and Connor picking up on a similar theme actually that a lot of answers are in the past like we used to live sustainably and we've lost the skill really isn't it and we're trying to re-educate ourselves and it's not that distant of a past that we used to do that so to regain that skill um, again okay so I can see that there are questions coming in on the chat um, and I want to make sure that we end up on time and that we have enough time for those questions as well so with no further ado we're going to hand over to Ben Craig who is director of Big Blue Mountains. So over to you, Ben. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen now. Okie dokie. So thank you so much, everybody. It's uh, an incredible pleasure to speak to you all today. And just, you know, the passion that's coming from Connor um, yeah. and from Paula is just so inspiring and you know really I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you anything different um, so I, I'm, I'm going to you know kind of maybe just pick up on some of those themes for the presentation I have and um, really sustainable business you know it's better business for a better world and the question to all of you is is your business fit for the future um, you know and, and that's that's really you know the, the question to ask um, and what can you do about that today? So we're going to pick up on some of these themes as we kind of go along. This is what I'm hoping to cover. Um, what does it mean to be a sustainable food business? So what is it in the first place? What is a sustainable business? What's a circular business? You know, we, we hear lots of kind of different bits of jargon kind of coming along, circular economy, sustainable business, all these different things, net zero. What does all this actually mean? So I'll try and unpick some of that for you a little bit because it's all very interrelated. But as, uh, as Connor said, he's been uh, studying this for about 20 years um, and he's still learning stuff today. So it's a big, complex subject um, and we could spend you know, the whole session talking about any of the different subjects that I'm going to kind of go into here today. So this is really an overview um, at this point. I'm going to give you a little bit of my background in running a, a food business and my journey with sustainability on that. We're going to look at some of the pros and cons of sustainability. You know, is it to your advantage? We're going to pick up on greenwashing. You know, uh, Paula was saying there, you know, people kind of going, yeah, I've got local sea bass on the menu. And she's like, oh, I do you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, greenwashing is a, a big issue. Uh, so we're going to pick up on that a bit. What can you do to kind of back up your words? Um, and, and how can some of those things help you along the way as well? So we can look at uh, accreditation. Um, to, towards kind of um, putting your money where your mouth is and, and being able to back it up. Um, and I believe, you know, very much like Connor was saying, success is strategic. You've got to plan this out. Um, so I think taking a step back to understand where you are and, and what the road before you is, is a really good step. And then we're going to look at some practical ideas for having a big impact and finish up with those uh, questions and answers at the end. So um, said I'm you know I'm a sustainable business consultant, um, but I, I started off in in a kind of food business. Um, so it's been a, a lovely journey for me. That's some of my contact details there. So firstly, what is a sustainable business? Well, you may have seen this model before. You may have heard it in, in different guises. Um, but a triple bottom line: people, planet, profit. It's merging all of these things. What's your social impact? What's your environmental impact? And what's your economic impact and how do these things come together to create value so you know we've talked quite a bit about you know what's that value chain um, from you know taking something from a farmer 
um, transforming it into something and presenting it to, to the customer. But, you know, what's the impact of the environment as part of that? And have you taken it into consideration in, in your buying? Um, what's the impact with your employees? Are you educating? What's the impact with your consumers? Are you educating them? What's your responsibility towards, you know, the people, you know, in the country that you're maybe purchasing your food from to take the avocado example and modern day, you know, slavery or human trafficking perhaps coming into that. Um, these are all the different elements that we need to consider as we come up with what's our value proposition in business? How can we integrate, you know, creating positive impact across all of these different areas at the same time? So it's a balanced purpose-driven approach. What's a circular business? Well, it's not this. This is take, make, use, waste, okay? This is the linear model that we're very familiar with. You know, so I'm gonna take something, make something with it, we'll use it, and then what's left will go in the bin and then we'll start again, okay? Um, circular business, um, is that closing the loop that Connor was talking about. So we take, we make, we use, and then we reuse or we recycle, okay? And we design out waste. Um, and what that does is it elongates your whole value proposition. So you extend the value of the product that you have. So instead of throwing half of your cauliflower in the bin, you've actually you know, really extended the value that that cauliflower has to your business. So uh, we can apply that in all sorts of different ways. Um, and that's maybe a lecture for another day. <laughs> um, so what was my journey in running a sustainable food business? Um, so in 2011, or sorry, yeah, 2011, I founded Root and & Branch um, and I started working with lovely organic local farmers like John McCormick in Helens Bay. And that led me on a journey into slow food. Um, I met Paula, I met Dorita Allen down in Ballymaloo, and I got to go to Italy and find out all about what is good, clean, fair food. And it really inspired me. And um, I was um, very passionate about coffee. I loved coffee. And um, I thought I was doing brilliant. I had, um, I'll, this will always kind of stand out to me. Um, I had triple certified coffee. It was fair trade. It was Rainforest Alliance and it was organic. I was so proud of it. Um, and um, I was down in Ballymaloo doing a, a food pop-up um, at their festival. And uh, Mark, who's the roaster down there, um, he said, oh, tell, tell me about your coffee. And I did. And he went, well, that's not very sustainable. And I went, what? <laughs> like, it couldn't be any more sustainable. And he said, well, you know, how fair is your fair trade? You know, um, and, you know, what size of a farm is that that's got that organic certification? You know, is that a micro grower or is it, a, you know, a mass production grower? Uh, where's the flavor in that coffee that, you know, is seasonal and um, that's kind of coming along? And so it totally turned things on my head and, and made me think about, well, oh, there's this thing called direct trade with farmers and um, establishing that relationship with farmers, you know, perhaps um, we can pay them, you know, more than, you know, a, a better price by going direct rather than paying a middle person in, in between. Uh, and by being transparent about that, we can start to change things. So the vision became um, to make world-class coffee in Belfast with a triple bottom line. Um, I read a book called The Social Entrepreneur Revolution um, and it transformed what I was thinking about. That was when I came across that, uh, that triple bottom line model um, and it started to really change you know, what, what I thought about you know, or what's charity or what's social enterprise or what's the sustainable business thing or, or what's a really uh, you know, commercial corporate view of, of the world. So I wanted to go and, and be accountable to the market, but at the same time, I wanted to do that with an ethical base. So that was the vision. Um, this is um, some shots taken from Ethiopia um, on a sourcing uh, visit that we went there. And you'll see that, you know, you might see some red cherries there. Um, th that's coffee. Um, coffee is a fruit. Um, and the other photos there are um, the people that are picking it. Every coffee cherry is hand-picked. And inside that cherry are two halves of a seed. Um, those two halves of a seed um, are then you know, dr dried uh, to get the mucilage off and then they're processed. And you can see in that kind of big uh, wooden spoon there um, at the other end, these are those green seeds. So um, that's what comes to us um, as roasters um, to transform into you know, the kind of brown coffee bean 
uh, that you're probably all quite familiar with. So this was our roasting process. Um, we had a tiny little space in Jameson Street on the Ormer Road. And it was about, you know, kind of really closing the loop for us um, between the roaster and the brewer um, and kind of really getting that, that whole uh, system down and, and trying to create that world class. Uh, class coffee that, that we were so keen about. So that was the coffee part. The other part was the Northern Irish food producers really inspiring what we could put on the plate. Um, so, you know, we, we took regular visits out to, uh, with our staff out to Helen's Bay Organic Gardens to go and visit John to learn what he had in season to learn about his approach to growing. Uh, and then we brought that to our plates. Um, so uh, we, you know, we worked with Boxty. We had Mike Thompson here from Mike's Fancy Cheese. Um, we were working with, you know, East Coast Seafood around what we were doing. Um, Springvale Farm for our eggs. Joe from Bower Bakehouse for our sourdough. Um, and really, it was about getting to know these characters and getting to know, you know, like, you know, this is them kind of bringing their stuff in, you know, taking waste out of the equation. Um, and kind of you know making it possible to really design that out from, from the get-go but make it appealing make it fun make it delicious make it seasonal you know uh, transform it as we kind of went along so um you know side note on the packaging um so the can that's being held up in there is not beer um that's our coffee beans uh, we started off with bags um and compostable but the first compostable bags that were on the market and then we learned that there weren't enough biodigesters uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, so we thought, oh, so that's actually going to landfill or being incinerated. So we thought, well, maybe we need to go fully recyclable. Um, and our roastery at that point had, had moved beside Boundary Brewery. So we thought, why don't we put our, our coffee beans in beer cans? Um, and then we can nitro flush them and extend the freshness and we can design out waste from our system and make it fully recyclable. So it extended the, the lifespan and the freshness um, and, and kind of designed out waste. So um, we were very lucky to be able to collaborate uh, along the way. This is a very short little video. And um, so this is a collaboration we did with Bushmills Whiskey. Um, so they came along to us and they said, we'd like to make the best Irish coffee in the world. Um, you know, we, we know you guys know that the guys in the Dead Rabbit in New York who make the best Irish co coffee cocktail in the world. And um, how can we elevate it? And how can we use our whiskey as part of the process? So they brought us out um, and we decided in the end to infuse the green beans before roasting um, in old whiskey casks. Um, and then we um, then we we took them to a kiln, you know, a kiln, dried them out, and, and, and made sure that they were um, dry enough, ready to roast, so they didn't bake um, instead. So it was a whole kind of R and D process on, on getting that right, but it was incredible, and the kind of booziness uh, in the coffee bean w w was just amazing. So it was incredible to work with such a big, uh, famous brand here, and you know, that just w was something about the alignment of. Um, the values uh, that we were displaying and why they came to us uh, in, in the first place. So that leads me uh, conveniently on to is becoming a sustainable business to your advantage. Um, and so here are some important considerations for you. Um, I've got some pros, I've got some cons too. The pros, growth, and we'll talk a little bit about B Corps um, shortly, but Purpose-led business drives performance. Um, this is demonstrably true. Um, B Corps report an average revenue growth of 14% year on year since they launched in the UK in 2015. So if your customers, if your staff, or if the people that are investing in your business are in any way interested in sustainability, and I would argue that the vast majority of them are or will be in the very near future, you're going to need to do something if you want to be able to grow um, and have them grow with you. Positive brand equity. So, you know, going back to the Bush Mills thing for us, um, that was they, they wanted to align with a brand that they felt was resonating with a sustainable consumer. Um, it's now mainstream. Um, and so, you know, um, if, if your brand is synonymous with sustainability, that's going to be the reason that Paul McIntyre comes to visit your, your restaurant. <laughs> um, so, um, it, you know, th there really is um, a huge um, competitive edge and an advantage in just keeping your brand start to think about what's, you know, 
what is their responsible um, consumption? Greater recruitment appeal. If you would like to attract the best talent and you'd like to retain the best talent, you want to be a purpose-led business. All the studies are showing this. Um, people are voting with their feet. Um, and if they come along, if you're kind of saying, you know, oh, we are, we're great, and we do this and we do that, and you don't really do it, they're going to leave um, and they're going to go to your competitor. Um, and, and that's just the way of the world at the moment. So um, you really need to kind of wear your heart on your, on your sleeve and, and, and show it um, and, and drive things forward with that ethical base um, if you're going to attract the best. Procurement opportunities, and, you know, Paul alluded to this as well. Um, I think, you know, from June 2022, if you don't know, um, you know, the Department for the Economy have announced that all public sector procurement in Northern Ireland uh, will have to demonstrate social value. Uh, and one of the big areas of, of that is around a commitment to net zero. If you're not doing that, and, you know, I think Belfast City Council's procurement from April is if you, if you don't score seven out of 10% that's available for social value, your tender application will not be considered. It will be dismissed immediately. Um, so, and that's things like paying a living wage, it's, it's commitment to net zero. Um, so it's, it's really integrating that triple bottom line business model um, from the get-go and being able to articulate and back up what you're claiming. Cons, it's a change in focus perhaps. You know, so if you start to kind of change what you're doing and you don't do that in the right way, that can shift your focus and you could have a detrimental effect on your business. Let's be real about that. You've got to be strategic and understand what you're doing um, because you're tinkering with, you know, a, a machine that works uh, at the moment or, or works in a particular way. Um, but what we want to do is, is enhance it. So cost and time. Time is money. Um, but you know, my, my argument back to you um, on this is, can you afford not to? Um, this is the direction of travel. Uh, are you on the bus or are you not? <laughs> are you going to be the first on it? Are you going to get on a, a bit later or are you going to get on when the bus is gone? Um, and I think you know, it's not a question of, of if you're going to have to do something. It's a question of when. Um, and so the longer you leave it, the more time it's going to take you to catch up and the more money it's gonna cost you uh, in the middle of all of that as well. So turning, the, turning a con on its head a wee bit there, but there we go. Greenwashing, what about it? What is it? So, you know, it basically means a company is claiming that its product or service is more environmentally friendly than it really is by using terms like eco-friendly or sustainable without having any evidence to support that claim. So, you know, Oh yes, my sea bass is sustainable. Oh, is it really? <laughs> Can you back that up, please? Um, did, you know, did you go out and catch that? Um, so I think it, it, it's very important to just understand this. You know, if you're going to make a claim on something, you just need to be able to back it up. Um, there are some rules coming in around this. Um, so in 2021, uh, in October there, the UK Environment Agency launched a new project which is going to standardise metrics that are used in the food and drinks industry for measuring environmental performance. So if you're not adhering to these standards, you know, you may come a cropper uh, on that front. And it's going to just get clearer about, you know, what does this terminology mean and how can you use it uh, as, as we go forward? But really, who cares? Who cares is your consumer? Who cares is your employee? And if you are greenwashing, they're going to spot it. You're going to be outed on social media and it will be swift and it will be brutal. Um, so, you know, bear that in mind <laughs> when you're making your claims. Um, <clears> that you know, the most important people to you um, are your consumers and your staff. Um, you won't have a business without them. Uh, and you've got to kind of bring them along on your journey. So sustainable business accreditation, what's out there? There's a myriad of things. I'm going to give you, you know, a couple of quick things which are maybe relevant to you. The Climate Pledge. This isn't really an accreditation, but it's a commitment. Uh, and when you make that commitment, um, this is around your journey to net zero. When are you going to achieve it uh, in terms of your scope one and scope two emissions and, and then your scope three following that? Um, there's a brilliant website, the smeclimatehub.org. Um, where you can sign up to that. There's loads of tools on it. Um, this is a, a part of the UK government's Road to Net Zero strategy. 
around uh, food and hospitality businesses, um, as well as other industries and, and specifically what you can do. Visit Belfast um, have put some money behind uh, the Green Tourism Awards, so they'll support you to get it uh, in terms of the cost. Um, you can go bronze, silver, gold. So again, you can have that journey and that roadmap forwards of starting where you are. You can um, certify yourself as being carbon neutral with the Carbon Trust. And uh, that's the only globally recognized one uh, that you can do that with. 1% for the planet is great. Um, they're doing some wonderful initiatives around the world in terms of uh, improving the environment. And um, so that really is a commitment to donate 1% of your profits towards that. B Corps, uh, I've left this one to last because it's really a, a huge movement um, and it's a little more, more complicated. So we're gonna take a, a little bit more of a dive into it. What is it? Um, well, basically it means that you change your constitution of your business so that you put stakeholders above shareholders. So that means that your supply chain, your employees and your consumers' interests are more important than shareholders' interests, i.e. the money. The money is important, but it's more important that you take into account everything else first and foremost. Um, there are four different areas where you'd be scored, governance, workers, community, and the environment. And you take an assessment called the B Impact Assessment in order to, to get your value on that. It's free to do the assessment. It costs money to do the certification. And that's because you're then audited. Um, so there's a verification piece to this as well. So in a world without, you know, kind of verification and a lot of certification and stamps, this is a great way of, of proving that you're not greenwashing. Um, and to be a certified B Corp, you need to score a minimum of 80 out of a possible 200 points uh, in, in order to achieve it. You'll see um, a lot of very familiar um, household names there um, that are already a B Corp in the UK. Globally, there's loads of really famous ones. Um, and in fact, um, and, I, and I know, you know Unilever is maybe a dirty word, but um, if you go to a big company like Unilever and you ask them, what's the most profitable area of your portfolio? It's B Corps. Um, so we'll just move on from there now. So success is strategic. Um, you really want to kind of set you know, a, a baseline of where you are. Um, you want to benchmark that against your competitors. You want to analyze where are the gaps? What can we do? Where are the quick wins? How are we going to, how are we going to catch up? That's going to give you recommendations of how you can innovate your business and make it more sustainable. And then you want to make an implementation strategy. So where do we start? Where do we go next? What's that future vision that we want to, that we want to create? Some practical ideas for a big impact. Number one, understand your customer. What are their needs and what are their wants? You need to identify how you can add value to you know, the product or service that you offer them, but you don't want to compromise uh, the value that your customer requires at the same time. So, you know, people really do care about their impact on the planet and, and, you know, and having local produce, but they also only have a particular window of time to have their lunch and they've only got so much money in their, in their pocket. So you need to appreciate those things when you're designing your menu. Um, and to make that work. So some of the tactics that Connor talked about are, are really helpful for that. Data is your friend. So the Pareto's law would, would state that 20% of your customer types will give you about 80% of your revenue. So if you're targeting which dishes you might want to, to affect at first, identify your most important customer segment. What's their average spend? What's their most popular dish? What's your margin on that dish? Can you increase it by reducing waste? If you pack that dish full of local and amazing ingredients and you maintain uh, that zero waste approach and you maintain um, your, your commitment to uh, their particular uh, uh, price point, uh, then you're gonna add great value to the customer. You're gonna support local consumers and uh, local, local producers, sorry, um, and you're gonna improve your carbon footprint along the way. Test before you launch. Don't let your ego get in the way. I've got it all figured out. You know, actually, you know, put, put your meal out there, you know, with, with a focus group, you know, get that 20% uh, uh, focus group together, get them in, get them trying it. Does it work? Try it out with those people. And if it does, then roll it out with confidence, okay? Be transparent and be authentic. 
storytelling is one of the most important powerful tools that you possibly have but you've got to use it wisely you got to be aware of greenwashing okay it, you know a good story can really propel your your business forward but it can spell catastrophe if you overextend okay um i'm going to finish you know just with one little um kind of uh, uh, quote here um from africa and that is if you want to go quickly go alone but if you want to go far go together Oh. Brilliant, Ben. Well done. I think um, even if we're on Planet Virtual, we need to give a round of applause out there to our three amazing speakers here this morning. Um, cheapers, it was riveting. Who needs TV? You know, when you can hang out here on Planet Virtual with these uh, insights here. I've made so many notes um, and I'm going to encourage people now uh, over the next 10 minutes or so to put uh, questions into the chat and unmute yourself. But if I could uh, maybe ask Ben to stop sharing so that it's us out here in Planet Virtual now. Uh, and actually, I have a couple of points that I would like to bring up. So um, I suppose it isn't it because I know you didn't coordinate this in advance of today's session. And yet there was amazing synergy in all three of the presentations. So, you know, you, you three are clearly friends and should hang out more together because, you know, there was a lot of, you know, there wasn't anything that was uh, off note there. Um, so based on what Paula said, Ben, and also your comment on Drina Allen, you, you made me think of something. So I remember working with Drina a while back and I always remember her saying you know I have you know say Germans from very busy companies coming to Ballymaloo to learn how to shell peas you know and I remember when she said it thinking and actually in that she's defined so much about hospitality and tourism in Ireland and a lot of you spoke about storytelling you know Paula the story of the pollen on the plate you know its local uh, provenance and Connor the story you know of the farmer on the plate and Ben you know the, the story through the plate and then you have to think uh, you know, it can be very useful to see Ireland uh, from the outside in sometimes, you know, and to the north of Ireland with its own unique story rather than the inside um, out. So you think you spin the globe and you land on this small island in the middle of an ocean on the west of the world. And the perception that there is about island people and how we live and how we share that story. And so coming back to what Connor said there, that a lot of our answers are actually in our recent past. And that is something that I am very much going to um, hang on to in today's session. And just pulling up on something that Paula also said about the Italians and the way they celebrate, celebrate regionality and seasonality. So you would know I lived in Italy through most of my 20s. Um, if you go from one region to another we all know this unique stories unique foods relating specifically to these areas but I remember hanging out in my 20s going actually we have this here too we're just not celebrating it we're not sharing the story and to go back to Paula's lovely insight into the pollen there I remember Paul Cunningham who you may know of more and larger a great British menu chef saying to me that he used pollen in one of the dishes on the tv show there and the other chefs were blown away they'd never heard about it and so again and again through hospitality and tourism we're mindful individually and collectively how we share the stories of who we are and the unique story of our place play, place and how that translates in everything we do offline as Paula said when we're just engaging with people or on the plate to what we present on it or online to our social media and I suppose you know I always felt this in hospitality and tourism but I feel it's come across really resounding today how one individual voice can be powerful and Ben ended with that amazing quote but the collective of voices across hospitality and tourism um, and the impact that that can have so Gary started off this morning saying this is the beginning of an inspiring conversation and I really feel that that's what we've had today um, so you know really I suppose you can see for me I feel super excited about the whole thing but I would like to invite people who are with us on today's session into the into the chat now you can unmute yourself and pop questions into the chat and then as we're waiting for this can I ask you because I was really interested in what you had to say about greenwashing and I suppose when we ever promote or present anything to the marketplace we always need to be, be sure that we're living up to the promise isn't that right you can't just you can't just fake it or as you say you'll be quickly outed and anyway why would you you want to do that anyway you know so so do you feel you were green washing uh unconsciously on your first round with coffee yeah 
Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so with an unconscious greenwashing, though, your yeah. intentions were right. Yeah, totally. I was approaching it with the, the greatest of intentions, but I was just, you know, uneducated. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, I, I needed to learn more. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and Mark was lovely with me, you know, th throughout that conversation, you know, and um, what once he saw that, you know, there was a willingness to learn uh, and I wasn't kind of just going, I've got it all figured out, you know, yeah. he was just like, well, that's really good. You know, you, you've kind of done this and this, but let's go a step further and let's interrogate that a little bit more. Let's understand it a little bit more and welcome to the world of specialty coffee. So, um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, there's a careful balance to be struck here, I think, you know, around the responsibility that we have as consumers to give people the benefit of the doubt to learn and not just cancel them out of hand, unless it's something that's really blatant and, you know, harmful. Um, I think, you know, giving people the opportunity uh, and space to move and to transform, I think is really, really important. Yeah. Um, and, and similarly, you know, on, on the other side, um, you know, we can be really passionate business owners um, that, you know, have, you know, really nailed our colors to the flag and, and are going, hey, right, I'm going down the sustainability journey and, you know, everything to do sustainable and, you know, and all the rest of it. And the consumer comes in and they're like, listen, I, di I didn't come in for a sermon. Um, yes. I came in for my, my lunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you go back over there, please? Yeah, because <laughs> so they're looking for yeah. a nice moment. And I see Connor nodding his head as you say that. Do you want to jump in there, Connor? Yeah, no, I, I mean, that, he hit the nail on the head. And that's the thing where I was mentioning earlier. It's not about preaching to people about, you know, a sustainable lifestyle. It's really just about putting the information out there. You've got to let people decide themselves. And when they're coming into restaurants and cafes, they're coming in to, to predominantly to sit down, eat great food and have a good time. Yeah. If we happen to educate them while they're doing that, but in, 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 a, in a correct manner where it's not being, you must do this, you know. It's um, not overwhelming. It should never exactly. feel underwhelming. Overwhelming, exactly. I should say. Yeah. And, and it's a way of almost disguising that you're educating someone. You're educating them through the plate of food in front of them. You're telling yeah. a story without them actually going away feeling that they were told is to kind of go away and realize that they've learned something as they as they were eating but in a way that wasn't driven directly at them driven home and you really brought home for me today all three of you who you know all five of you who spoke today that um you know you can think about connor you mentioned you know liaising with the farmer or the beekeeper and you use their ingredients say for example on your menu and isn't it interesting in our you know in our world you know the, the fisherman or the beekeeper the farmer they just can exist every day they're living the life they're harvesting they're producing the products but actually the storyteller is the person who shares the experience or the chef who puts the ingredient on the plate and and so it's always of interest to me that without say hospitality and tourism that is the vehicle through which we share the story the word can't spread as quickly so there's a huge opportunity through what you've started today and through everyone present in our own stepwise manner as Ben was saying that we could um, really create a, a huge piece a huge narrative around the story um, you know in this in this destination and destination Northern Ireland. So I'm just going to um, ask if there are any further questions from the group. Would anyone like to unmute themselves and jump in and ask uh, Ben or Michelle or Gary or Paula or Connor a question for themselves? Is everyone OK out there? Or would anyone like to jump in with anything or uh, uh, Orla, so Taste Co, we believe that events and experiences are very important to educate and consume. Thanks for that, Sharon. The consumer on local provenance, the story, and drive future sales. Okay, so this is from uh, Sharon Scott. Okay, so you can battle it out to see whoever gets in first. Okay, my friends. So Taste Callway. Taste Codes, we believe that events and experiences are very important to educate and enthuse the consumer on local provenance, uh, the story, and drive future sales. Do you agree? Well. Yeah, Paula, do you want to jump in there? Yeah. Well, well, I'm involved with Taste Causeway, so uh, yeah. and I'm, I'm not going to argue with Sharon either. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, oh, I, I completely agree. I'm tired. Yeah, no, nobody's yeah. going to. No, but I think that I think, and it's right across the whole region, not just Taste Causeway. That you know, I think 
you know, people, there is a really, I, I, we have noticed that we have all these experiences and they're selling out in, in minutes, you know, there is definitely an appetite for something different, you know, that you're going out. Uh, we, the, none of these experiences, they are, there's no choice in them. You just, you, you take it and you embrace it. And I think that's the thing. It's that we don't need, we don't need this massive choice. And it's, uh, and, and really, I do think we need to sort of, uh, Give people something interesting. You know, we, we, you can be sustainable, and your and everything can still be really tasty. And the other thing we have to remember is fun and crack. That's what yeah. we're famous for. You yeah. have to have that. It's not just about you know serving good food. You, yeah. we, we have to we have to do it that it's entertaining. That people want more and, yeah. and keep coming back for more. That's yeah. the thing. And 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 evolving and changing. You have to do that. There's no, you can't just give somebody an experience that was great and, and, and rest in your laurels. We we'll have to just keep moving and, and keep evolving and keep coming up with different ideas and, and different things, definitely. To bring them along. And I actually loving all of what you're saying there, because of course in hospitality and tourism, there's a huge amount of creativity, but actually there's also, there has to be a huge degree of practicality, as you say. Um, and Ben, I'm going to pick up on something that you said there, um, focused on the consumer and the employer first uh, over profitability. That's actually something I learned um, the hard way in my own career, because I've always been involved in experience development and commercial. And first I thought it was all about the strategy of commercial, um, which would bring in the revenue. But then I learned to actually look after the customer meet their needs and the profit actually looks after itself that's something I really had to learn along the way so I'm really on board with that Michelle how about you jump in there yeah I just was going to agree I totally agree with you Sharon I agree with Paula um had an interesting experience last week we had a, a meeting about the Cumber Early Potato Festival um first time it's been running in a number of years and one of the growers was there Richard Orr and years ago Richard part of the reason why we started the potato festival was to educate uh, people about why the Cumber Early is a special, different potato. And yet still a lot of the people in the room didn't understand that it's, you know, it's planted early, it's not top finished, it's not stored. It actually has very high sustainable credentials. But when, um, when Richard started to speak and explain to the other people in the committee about the story, the backstory about the Cumber Early potato, there was complete silence he was, I just totally agree with what you say there, Connor. He was, Richard was such an authority. He understands the land. He knows where you plant the potatoes. And he was just able to get it over um, with real honesty and passion and integrity. And um, so, yeah, we, ju we just got to, as Paula says, keep moving forward, keep reinventing because this, this sustainable issue is going to become, you know, much more prominent. Thanks. Yes. So as Beth, thank you so much, Michelle. So as Ben said, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It is it is something uh, that we all need to get on board with. Can can I just ask our panel this morning? Um, there was so many, as I, I've taken literally by five or six pages of notes myself. But if we were to just go here, where do I start? I'm listening in today. Where's my starting point? Um, you know, I've learned a lot of information. I'm kind of go, gosh, I'm interested in this. I want to get going. Um, but this is my, you know, first insight into this. Where would I begin? Would anyone like to jump in there? Yeah, I, I think for me, sorry, jumping in. Um, Can kind of go for it? For me, I, I think the beginning has to be your procurement system. It has to, you have to deep dive and be very honest with yourself or your business about where you are purchasing your ingredients from. Um, and that's the biggest change you're going to make at the beginning is, is really about, um, you know, purchasing more sustainably, purchasing seasonal food, but also what are you purchasing outside of the island of Ireland? You know, food is important. Of course it is. Um, like Ben mentioned earlier around your coffee, there's also your tea, your spices, your sugars, your fruits. You, you really got to be very honest and, and, and critical of yourself of what you're buying and why you're buying it. Is it just price led? That's a false economy in some ways. Um, so start with that, start with your procurement system and really look how, at how to buy better. It's then that when you get the food and the ingredients, it's what you do with them, you know, but you got to work with sustainable, better ingredients coming in first. And then the rest of the journey comes from there. Comes from there. Well done. I'm just going to call on Gary, Gary there, Gary Quaid, because I see your hands up, Gary. Yeah, um, just, just taking that critical view, um, Julie, as, as Connor said, is, is really, really important in terms of how we're doing business, how we can start to make efficiencies, how how we can look within 
But going back to a point that, that Ben had made earlier, and it was another point that had come up on our session last week, um, in terms of if you are looking for procurement opportunities or you're looking for new business opportunities, and this will probably speak to you, Julie, as well, just with, with your, your, your B2B background, is that when we're talking about tourism and we're looking at experiences, B2B um, uh, and those operators now are looking at um, sustainable practices. What is your one pager? What is your commitment to sustainability? How can you now start to look at that? How can you frame that? Because has been about um, throwing the ideas out there, but I think we need to recognise, um, particularly with the number of the businesses that we have here, we have a lot to celebrate. We do have a lot to be um, proud of, but how do we now start to put our best foot forward when it comes to procurement, when it comes to the sales um, yeah. opportunities? And that was a big takeaway, I think, for ourselves on last week's session. Also. Yeah, and Gary, I'm so interested that, and there are a couple of hands going up, so I'm going to get around to everyone that you brought that up, because there actually was a recent buyer ses uh, session, and I was talking to, I suppose, a few friends and colleagues after that, and they were saying a lot of businesses were bringing up the topic of sustainability, a bit like Ben was saying, you know, saying they were sustainable, but actually few could show in practice that they were living up to this, and there is one, I don't want to uh, blow their trumpet too early, but there is going to be one hotel with an incredible sustainable story that's going to be announced in the north for a shortly, um, you know, gold standard, sustainable first on the island of Ireland, sustainable story. And when they actually brought their story to the buyers, they, they, the comment that came back was, and you really are. This is the first time all day we've heard, and bear in mind, this was destination Northern Ireland uh, tourism business. This is, and all the businesses that they were hearing from across the island, that you are the first one we've heard that really is. So how important that story is to consumer and the buyers and, um, you know, taking up Ben's term, not greenwashing, but living up to the promise um, in, in, in reality or else avoiding it until you arrive there, you know. Um, can I just call, I see Kim uh, out there with your hands up. Do you want to jump in there, Kim? And I noticed you're doing some work on a culinary arts degree. Hi, yes. Um, some of you in the group might know me from previous kind of um, workshops and things that I've done. And uh, I'm going to be going back into lecturing. And one of the things that I'll be teaching on is a new culinary arts degree, and it's called the Sustainable Kitchen. And what I want to do over the next few months is to gather some best practice case studies or businesses that are moving through the process of starting from zero and working their way up to becoming more sustainable. So if any of you are interested, in becoming a case study or a site visit or working with me i've actually put my wrong email address in the chat so i'll just go on now and put my correct email address in Perfect. thank you well done kim and before i pass to michelle uh Sherlo, um i just want to pick up on something that portia has said in the chat there so obviously no stranger to food it, is, it also is important to recognize that using sustainable food gives hope to not only general people but those making the change in the food industry and, and i think that's such an important point that we can inspire ourselves you know may really affect change in our businesses and within the industry but actually and i love the way michelle describes the story of the potato there inspire um our local community firstly to stand up and be proud of what we are and that spills out into wider communities there then as well so really interesting michelle do you want to jump in there well just to follow on i mean i totally agree again with connor i mean it's so much depends on your procurement system um recently i was at a dinner and they I'm not going to name anybody, but they said they were trying to tell me they had a lot of local suppliers and I had a few glasses of wine in me at the stage. And I said, look, I can name 100 local suppliers within 20 miles here that you don't have on your menu. Um, so hopefully there'll be a change there. Um, the other thing that shocked me recently was I was asked last year to judge some green awards. And I was just really amazed. Was, I think Ben, you and I had a conversation about this. So many of the large businesses are approaching this issue really from the point of view of saving money. And it almost was like, you know, uh, the old just in time procurement systems. And I really agree with, uh, you know, the whole panel. It has to come from, you know, the heart. It has to be more than just a drive to cut down on costs because, you know, I, I think I'm not, um, I'm not a generation said or whatever it is but i could see through some of these applications that it wasn't really about sustainability it was just about cost control 
yeah yeah so you'll hear if it's hollow you'll hear it you'll yeah. hear if it's just a, a line and so i think again we'll call on those great words that paula said good clean and fair that that backbone of integrity is really important to everything that we we do there kerry thanks so much a great business lady in the world of uh drinks in northern ireland for the comment that you wrote in there finding today's session so interesting lovely to see you there <coughs> um look we might take one or two questions because i personally don't want to go i know other people might so I'm going to ask one or two. Um, so um, where can a business get support? So where can we start? We've addressed that one. I, again, I've turned up today, super interested in this. Where's the first door I'd open to get support? Ben, do you want to, or Gary, do you want to jump in? Yeah. yeah it's just to say, Julie and, and Michelle might cover this um, just in, in, in the wrap up. Well, one huge learning is trying not to condense a sustainability workshop into 90 minutes. We'll yes. make such a great panel yes. um, with, with, with lots of ideas. But um, Michelle and the team at Food and I will be consolidating, I suppose, all of the great points, the great tips. Uh, where, to, where can we go to for help? Can we touch on some of the accreditation stuff that, 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 ben, um, that, that, that ben brought to us? By way of a toolkit, so we will be following up with everyone um, that has joined the past um, two webinars. So, um, just as that really strong call to action. So today's just about stimulating the conversation, but also keeping in touch as well. And and, and that will come to the guys then at Food and I. But the panelists might have their own um, in terms of sharing information. Can we contact? Are they happy that we share contact details, etc.? So it might be good to to throw that out there. Okay, and that can go into the toolkit maybe as well, Gary. Yeah, if if, if people are willing. Yeah. 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 And before maybe we hand over to Michelle there, Gary, what did you think of today's session? What's the, what's been a standout for you? Yeah. I mean, just the quality of the speakers and the insights that that, that everyone's brought. I think everyone complimented um, each other's delivery. Um, all very different angles and aspects, but clearly, you know, coming from the, the heart, coming from a, um, a place where we want to influence change and, and how we do that. But how, how do we do that together? You know, what's the What's our collective proposition but um also just to say our industry continuing to to turn out to hear about sustainability about experience development and what's still a very very difficult time and um, for tourism and hospitality businesses so the fact that they're that they're, they're they're coming on they're showing up they're getting energized and um, for something new um, and they want to find out what support and development is available and i know that michelle and her team at food and i want to spotlight uh, the quality of our food and drink, the quality of our of our green tourism experiences across April, and today was uh, was about um, forming that conversation and framing that all. Yeah, no, it was really fantastic. So I tell you what, how about we do a quick move round to Michelle Sherlow and leave the final word with Food and I, who I think organised an incredible lineup today, an amazing diversity, a coherency across the presentations. So if we could do this very quickly before we land at Michelle and Connor, just because you know you're on my top right there, what was the key? What would you be your key standout note from today or in anything you said for people who are joining the session? So if you want to unmute yourself there, the key standout thing. I think, I think the key standout for me. And, and and all the great speakers were were all talking in the one in the same hymn sheet. But I, yes. I think the key thing is is don't be afraid to, to make the changes that are necessary for your business. And um, because it's not just about making your business sustainable; it's about the entire food system. Which yes. without it, your business is not sustainable anyway. Exactly. So I, I I think the biggest takeaway is that it, these changes need to happen, but they can be, they can happen in a very controlled. Uh, manner. So aiming to get to a fully rounded, uh, you know, uh, process, but a stepwise manner to get there, correct? Exactly. exactly. Super. Yeah. And to Paula, how about yourself? The key thing that stood out for you today, Paula? I think the key thing for me was um, uh, Ben's uh, word greenwashing. I'd never yeah. heard that before. I I'm glad I was ashamed. I was afraid to say I hadn't heard it myself. I agree. Go on. <laughs> no, it actually, it, it actually articulates I for me a lot of, of, the, yeah. of what's happening and, and avoidance of greenwashing, I think, is what I'll take away from today. Yeah, I totally agree. And actually, um, uh, sometimes even we could be greenwashing without being aware. And I think Ben's first uh, foray with coffee was great to illustrate that as well. OK, and then on to you then. What's your key standout note from today's session? My key standout note is, you know, this is a big, broad, complex base that, you know, is going to take a lot of work and effort to, you know, to get through. But it's something that we can do joyfully. Let's yes. make it a party that people want to go to, you know? 
But we all yeah. have a party. That's really great. Yeah. Yeah. Joyful. And I suppose bringing back to, you know, not over complicating things either. Like Connor Spacey said, in our recent past, we were doing a lot of this. So learning from that recent past and, you know, bringing it to the present, really important. Well done, Ben. That's super. OK. And our last word over to uh, Fuda and I and Michelle Sherlow. Really amazing lineup of speakers, Michelle. Uh, I've been totally inspired, but I'm going to leave the last word with you and maybe uh, just an insight again into the call out for the uh, taste of Ulster restaurants. Okay, thank you. So, um, well, I'm going to try and share screen again, which is, um, this is just, I mean, it's been a great morning, really appreciate um, everybody, all the speakers, it's been fantastic. So, as we said at the start, we are going to um, try and promote some of your sustainable recipes and ideas. So here are a few top tips. Um, last week, we talked about experiences. I think if anybody is interested in, in experiences, it would be worthwhile following up with us afterwards because it's a slightly different approach. But for uh, our sustainable heroes, for our sustainable recipes, what we're looking for is authentic Northern Ireland sustainable recipes and maybe an accompanying image so think outside the box and as i was playing the advert earlier um it occurred to me that it's maybe worthwhile going back and having a wee look at that again on facebook because we had to pick uh, imagery off uh, social media we had to take it from members and um, we're also looking for new imagery to put into it but if you look at that style it might be helpful so maybe it could be as i said a recipe um, and an image, it could be a cocktail or a drink recipe from some of our great locally produced spirit ciders or beers. It could be an afternoon tea shot with local food and drink. It could be foraging for edibles. It could be imagery of farming visits with the strong food and landscape theme. I think one thing that we want to do is we want to get through a sense of place. Oops, nearly show you that part again. So <laughs> we want to um, get across the message that you're in Northern Ireland. So as well as sustainable, it'd be good if it was distinctly Northern Irish as well. Um, and what we will be doing is a promotion around those. It'll be a mixture of different things. It'll be social media. Um, it could be some uh, bloggers going out to a restaurant. Um, it can be incorporated in the TV ad or sorry, on the social media ads or it will be traditional press as well. The key thing is to get it to Orla um, at NI Good Food, and Orla will be in charge of um, helping with that. Now, I can't go back. So you're, you're okay there, yeah. you could, yeah, well done. So sorry, finally, just, yeah, we're also looking for video as well as photography. So video can be great. Um, as you saw in the advert, we took tiny clips of video and connected them together and it all looked you know really professional so don't worry about it being too high tech simple video can work really well and um, in format if you can please include some imagery and some copy to give us some context if you provide us with social media handles we will tag you and as you can see email it directly to orla at nigoodfood.com Thank you very much. Oh, you're wonderful, Michelle. So uh, lovely. I just see Portia Woods jumping in there. Thank you for a great session. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So uh, just thank you to all our speakers this morning, starting off, of course, with the wonderful Michelle Sherlow of Food and I, who's been, I know, working super hard behind the scenes to pull uh, this whole session together. On to Gary Quaid from Tourism Northern Ireland. Uh, Connor Spacey of Director, uh, Director at Food Space. I've not met you before, Connor. I'm looking you up, super interested in a lot of the stuff that you have to say there. Same goes to you, Paula McIntyre. Wonderful session. Loved all the food pictures. We'll be remembering those all day today uh, from Slow Food Causeway. And Ben, brilliant insights based on real life. Someone who's walked the walk, which is something we like to hear, a director at Big Blue uh, Mountain. So uh, I think on that note, uh, we went a little over, but I believe it was worth it. Um, have a lovely day, guys. And look, isn't this a wonderful opportunity to begin that stepwise story to really creating a resounding narrative for Destination Northern Ireland for 
its food, its specific provenance and sustainability. So well done, guys. Total pleasure. A big thank you to Ginny as well oh, sure. for, uh, for hosting today. Yeah. And uh, just a big thank you again to all the panelists um, for supporting yeah, um, Tourism and I and Food and I on this journey. And uh, we will be in touch with everyone um, and we'll do a mop up of the last two sessions. So a big thank you again to everyone. A big thank you to you, Julie. And we'll see you again. Yeah, Take thank care. you, everyone. Have a good day. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.